So we, are, we will um, begin uh, as the slides, even as the slides are uh, arriving. And we're going to hear first from, from Jorge uh, Padilla, uh, who is going to cover, um, a, a, as you may know, unfortunately, Kurti Gupta is not going to be here. Um, but uh, Jorge will cover some of what she would have, would have covered as well. Um, so, uh, Jorge, your actually slides are coming up. Yeah, and I'll go they there are then. They're emerging. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation to be here with you today. I think that my, my job now has multiplied by 1.5, not necessarily by 2, because I need to cover some of the ground that Kerti Gutta was going to cover, and she unfortunately is not able to be with us uh, today. But basically her point was, uh, if I understand correctly from her slides, and I've been co-authoring uh, some work with, uh, with Kerti, so I think I have an understanding of what she was uh, thinking of saying, is that there is no doubt that cooperative standards are fundamental for our economy, that uh, standards have contributed to you know, the well-being of society, that they have contributed and enhanced innovation, that they have led to better products, that they have saved transaction costs, that they have been, therefore, positive contributors to economic uh, and consumer welfare in particular. But they have, associated with them, created lots of disputes and discussions. And so far, these discussions have been focused on how to split the rents associated with standardization between innovators and implementers. And antitrust has been used as a tool to shift rents from innovators to implementers. Of course, some people would think that antitrust has been used to create rents. But Curtis' view, and I subscribe that view, is that, in fact, all that antitrust has done is to shift rents from one group to the other. And that in doing so, the net effect on innovation has been negative. Because even if some rents transferred to implementers may have led to greater innovation at that level, there are many ways in which implementers can obtain a reward for innovation, whereas innovators obtain a reward for innovation by licensing. And if licensing is made difficult because of antitrust intervention, then that rate shifting has ended up with a net negative effect on innovation and has therefore undermined the positive effects on society of the standardization program. But what Cathy says in her presentation, and I again agree with her, is that that debate now is of second order importance. That the real debate, that the real issue these days is not in the confrontation between implementers and innovators in the West. That the real issue now is a geopolitical issue and a confrontation between the West and the East, or if you want, in particular, China versus US slash EU. And that that's where we should pay and focus our attention. And that the battles between implementers and innovators are to some extent a distraction a distraction that weakens the position of the West in this confrontation with China, in this confrontation with uh, China, a China that seeks to dominate standards as explicitly stated in its 2035 standardization initiative. And that, therefore, to the extent that we spend time and effort debating issues such as what is the appropriate level of licensing, debating issues such as you know, the extent to which injunctions should be allowed or not, debating issues that have to do with the royalty base, we are playing to the advantage of our geopolitical rival. That's her view. And as I said, I largely agree with that. And that, then I moved to my presentation. I was thinking how to capture this geopolitical confrontation and how to deal with this geopolitical confrontation in the realm of SEPs, more generally, in the, in the technologi technological space. And that's where I'm going to introduce to you some slides, which according to Doug, nobody understands except uh, me, but I trust that once I present them in English, you will understand them. So I wanted to do a little model that would be able to illustrate my narrative. 
So in this little model, and models are that, and they are maps at the scale. You know, there is no use in a map scale one to one. We all agree. Models are, you know, like maps, simplifications of reality. We have two countries, for lack of imagination, West and East, Bellevue and E. Each country can invest in two dimensions, can invest in growing the standard, and that's investment G, growth, growth in the West, growth in the East. The more they invest, the more, the greater the benefits generated by the standard. These benefits are captured by these functions B. They're different. The benefits in the West need not be identical to the benefits in the East. But what is important is that the more the West invests, it increases the benefits both for, B, for West and East. And the more the East invests, it increases the benefits for West and East. There are positive externalities generated, and cooperation is valuable. But there is another dimension of investment. And this is investment in appropriating the other's benefits. And I'm calling this S, share, the share. What is the share of the, other, of the other's benefits that I can capture if I invest? The West can invest in that activity. The East can invest in that activity. Each of these investments involves some costs. And therefore, we can calculate the benefits of the West and the East from the standardization. The West benefits from the joint investment, but the benefit that appropriates is a function of how much the other side, the other country, is investing in appropriating its rents. And the West can also benefit from the benefits for the East if it invests in capturing some of these benefits. And then there are costs. And the same applies to one country and the other. Of course, these investments in capturing benefits, these, uh, in pirating, or in, in, in appropriating the benefits generated for the other, this is a shortcut for a number of activities, including antitrust policy. How we can use our antitrust policy to capture the benefits that belong to the other. Our IP policy, are we going to respect the benefits of the licensors in the West? If we don't, then the rents are going to be appropriated by the East, and the West will benefit less. So this S captures the design of antitrust policy, the design of intellectual property, and other activities that are rent-seeking activities. Well, we can use calculus to determine what is the level of investment that each of the two sides will make in each of the two activities. And basically, in the first equation, in each of the two, for each of the two countries, the first one, you know, if we, I look at the East, the East is going to choose how much to invest in appropriating rents, and that's going to depend on what is the marginal cost of those activities, what is the cost of investing in appropriating the rents of the others, and how much there is at the stake. And in this case, what is at the stake, the marginal return of investing in appropriating the rents are the benefits in the West. The second equation tells us how much they are going to invest in growing the, uh, the pie in growing the standard. And that's going to depend on what is the cost of uh, investing in growing the standard and how much the investment generates, what is the return, which of course is a function of how much the other appropriates. We are in a world of competition. The two sides are cooperating in growing the standard, but they are competing when they try to see how much of the standard gener the value generated by the standard they appropriate. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's, trivial, and I it's trivial to see that if the benefits of the standard for the East are less than for the West, and if the cost of investing in appropriation is less in the East than in the West, what the East is going to do is going to invest a lot in appropriating rents. It's also easy to see that actually both are worse off than if they were able to commit not to engage in these rent shifting activities. If they were to agree that their antitrust policies and IP policies were going to be respectful of the rents of the other. There is a risk of fragmentation. Because at some point, if we think that the East is investing more in appropriation than the West and less in developing the standard than the West, the West can say, OK, you know what? I'm going to have my own standard. And there is going to be fragmentation. 
Now, that has a cost, of course, because these fragmented standards, the one in the West and the one in the East, are going to be, by definition, worse than a standard in which there is collaboration from both sides. I mean, after all, the ideas come randomly, and it can come to one guy, it can come to one company, or the other, and it's good if they can exchange these ideas and put them together. Leaving aside that risk of fragmentation, what we have is a classical prisoner's dilemma. Yes, it would be good if we cooperated and restricted our investment in reshifting and focus all our efforts in growing the standard. But given that you behave, my optimal response is to deviate and appropriate some of your rents. And the country that is going to do that first is the country that has a lower cost. And I will conclude with two ideas. Given that we have a prisoner's dilemma, we need to try to solve that prisoner's dilemma. Fragmentation involves costs, but also the threat of fragmentation won't bring the other side to the cooperation because it's irreversible. Game theory tells us that if you want to solve a prisoner's dilemma and generate cooperation, you need an effective tit for tat. And a tit for tat is, what is, a, is a strategy that punishes when the other side deviates but immediately moves back to cooperation as soon as the other party collaborates. Fragmenting the standards is a bad solution. What we need to do, if you follow the equations, and that will require a little bit more time, what we need to do is to increase the cost of adopting antitrust policies and intellectual property policies, intellectual property protection policies that are appropriative, that they are rent shifting. We won't do well, again, according to those formulas, by reducing the value of the standards in the East, for example, by prohibiting them from selling products that embed the technology in the standard. The right approach is to try to punish them if they invest in rent shifting activities using your own initiatives, for example, how you deal with your intellectual property, or policies that are outside this standardization realm. I have very little time, so I'll stop here. Thank you, Jorge. I hope we can return to that uh, in the uh, panel discussion and then the Q&A and get, put some more flesh on the bones. It's really interesting. OK. Igor, please. Thank you. Uh, I don't have slides, but I wanted to share with you as a lawyer a uh, legal perspective about what is happening in Europe and a bit in the US with respect to SAP cases and SAP licensing practices. And I would like to have a bigger picture and say that in the last few years, we can observe a convergence between the approaches in Europe and the US with respect to the role of antitrust law in licensing SAPs, as well as about certain SAP licensing practices. So I will fo focus on three things. So one which dominated antitrust and policy discussions is can the SAP owner request and obtain injunction for the infringement of SAPs? Is that anti-competitive? Uh, the scope of a friend license uh, is a global portfolio license friend, or is that anti-competitive tying? And finally, the last important question is, must the SAP owner license to any company that requests so, regardless of the position in the production chain? And courts in Europe and in the US have recently provided answers to all of these issues. About injunctions, in Europe, we now have elaborate practice. We have, if you know, Huawei versus ET case, which provided a framework of when the injunctions are available and when there may be antitrust offense. And the courts have said, examined in depth the negotiation behavior of both parties, and they said, Yes, injunctions are available against licensees that are unwilling to take a license. 
then the next question is, well, what is unwilling licensee? How do we establish that? It's a legal standard. And we have an important case from Germany, from the German Federal, uh, Federal Supreme Court in CISPR versus Hire, where this was the key question. Was the licensee willing to take a license? And the court said that an implementer must first negotiate in a target-oriented manner, meaning it wants really to achieve a target, a license, and it also must clearly and unambiguously declare that it is prepared to take a license on whatever terms the court find is friend. And on the facts of the case, the implementer, what was he doing is saying that it is prepared to negotiate, but not really to take a license, or only take a license on terms that he considers to be a friend. And the court said, well, this is conditional willingness, and we cannot accept that. And also in the UK, we had a case, Optis versus Apple, where Apple tried something similar, saying, well, we don't want to commit now of taking a friend license. We want to wait until the litigation is over to see what are the terms, and then we will consider whether we will take the license or not. And the court said, well, this is not a behavior of a willing licensee. And we have another large chunk of cases dealing what is a delaying tactics, how long should you wait, how long do you need to respond to a licensing offer, and all of that provides some kind of a licensing framework for the SAPs, which we didn't have before. <clears throat> and as to the second question about portfolio licensing, uh, the argument was that if a company offers a portfolio license that is tying different patents from different territories that may be anti-competitive, and the courts, Supreme Courts, both in the UK and in Germany said, well, no, this is a normal co commercial practice between companies that operate globally. Uh, SAPs are complements. Global companies need all the portfolio to operate legally, and there is nothing anti-competitive in it. And finally, the big question now in the automotive sector as well is, can the SAP owner choose a level of the production chain to license uh, and device makers, for example, or must the SAP owner offer a license to any company that requests so, regardless of the production chain? And in the US, if you may be aware of, we have two cases, FTC versus Qualcomm and Continental versus Avanci. So the Qualcomm case was in smartphone sector and Continental case was in automotive sector. And in both of these cases, SAP owners had a policy of licensing only to end device manufacturers, to smartphone manufacturers, to car manufacturers, but not directly licensing to component manufacturers. And component manufacturers asked for a direct license, and they were refused. And the argument was this refusal to license was a competition law problem. And, and in the US, both the Ninth Circuit and Fifth Circuit said, no, we don't see any antitrust injury in this case. Why? It is because how licensing system works. They say by the patent owner choosing to license only at the one level of the production chain, component manufacturers don't need a license. And they're not asserting patents against them. So the Ninth Circuit said basically this is kind of a de facto royalty free license. Many com com uh, component manufacturers don't need a license to operate in the market. And we also have similar cases in Europe, uh, where courts said that also European competition law doesn't apply in this case. And also they said, as a matter of principle, they interpreted the friend commitment, licensing commitment, and said, well, it means providing access to the standard, not necessarily granting license to each and every company. And this access can be provided by different means. One way <coughs> is to license to end device manufacturers directly, and this way allow access to all others in the production chain. So what I want to say that 
when we talk about policy discussions about the role of antitrust law in SCP cases, courts have actually recently provided answers. And they looked specifically at facts of each case and said that at least in these three situations, antitrust had, has, doesn't have a role to play. And uh, what does this mean for the future? Uh, I think it is, in my view, good that the Department of Justice has said that it will now examine SAP cases on a case-by-case -case basis. They will not give another policy statement. And I believe if you look now to the new cases, new problems like anti-suit injunctions in China and anti-suit injunctions in Europe, or licensing in the IoT, the Internet of Things, or in car sector, I believe that if we leave the system to, to the market, to the market solutions, to courts, maybe they will find the right answers as they did in previous cases. So this is my small and brief presentation, and I'm looking forward to discussion if you have questions about European practice. Thank you. Thank you, Rikor. Very nice. One talk. One talk. One talk. One talk. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Wen Tong Zeng, and I'm a professor of law at University of Florida Levin College of Law. Uh, it's my great honor to be invited to this conference and speak at this panel. I was given seven minutes, so I will try to be quick. Uh, I'm going to uh, follow up on um, uh, the presentation made by Dr. Padilla about the geopolitical conflicts in SEP litigation. And I'm going to focus particularly on the use of anti-suit uh, anti injunctions, particularly by Chinese courts in recent uh, SEP disputes. Uh, as we know, anti-suit injunctions um, are a traditional tool that common law jurisdictions have long used. But since one US court used uh, an anti-suit injunction in the Microsoft versus Motorola case in, 19, in 2012, <laughs> uh, this tool has been employed in SEP litigation. Uh, uh, the U.S. courts are very active in issuing anti-suit injunctions, um, but arguably U.S. courts have um, standards, right? have procedural standards on uh, when to issue them. So the success rate um, at the U.S. courts is not particularly high. Uh, but in, re in recent years, since 2020, we are seeing a very aggressive push by Chinese courts in issuing anti-suit injunctions. Right? In 2020 alone, there were uh, five ASIs being issued. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the success rate there is pretty high. There's only one case uh, that I know uh, in which the Chinese court um, denied the request for an ASI. That's the Lenovo versus Nokia case. Uh, in, 2000, uh, in early 2021. Um, and in response to the Chinese court's uh, anti-suit injunctions um, in the other countries like UK, excuse me, UK, Germany, France, and India, they issued anti-anti-suit injunctions, and in some cases, even anti-anti-anti-suit injunctions. So we see this kind of ping pong um, going on there. Um, now, the, the, the problem with the Chinese anti-suit injunctions is as I said earlier, the success rate is very high. The, lower, uh, the, the standard appears to be much lower. Okay? And in some cases, they are even saying you cannot enforce uh, your IP right uh, in any jurisdictions, not necessarily in a specific jurisdiction in which you have filed your case. So the anti-suit injunctions may cover any future actions in any jurisdictions um, anywhere. Okay? So that appears to be very, uh, very broad. And if you combine that with the fact that the Chinese courts usually set the lowest uh, friend rate uh, in SEP litigation, uh, so that is quite concerning from the point of view of patentees. Uh, so basically, uh, the Chinese courts are depriving patentee, uh, patent owners of their ability to enforce their IP right. Uh, so unless they are willing to forego the Chinese market, um, you know, they, they have to deal with the anti-suit injunctions issued by Chinese courts. 
Okay. Uh, as um, Dr. Perdila mentioned, right, this is uh, a geopolitical uh, issue. Right? There are uh, national security considerations uh, here. Okay? So both in the U.S. and China are trying to gain advantage in the um, battle for um, you know so, uh, technology, right? In, in important areas like 5G, uh, uh, autonomous um, vehicles, right? Uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, vaccine, right? So uh, in all those areas, there is national uh, um, national interest being at stake there. Um, and uh, you know, if you think about the potential areas in which ICEP may play um, important roles down the road, right? This uh, ge geopolitical tension is going to get uh, even high, higher. I would actually say. Um, so, uh, but I want to make the view, uh, make the take the position that. Uh, maybe uh, you know the the Chinese anti suit injunctions are a concern, but we should not categorize them in, apoc uh, in apocalyptic terms. Right? So because um, if you look at this, um, there are some um, uh, natural limiting factors to how far the Chinese courts can go. Right? So I would argue that uh, in issuing the anti suit injunctions, one important goal of the Chinese courts is to um, is to uh, you know to help the Chinese firms, right? Um, you know because most of them are still implementers at this stage. But another important goal there is the, the so-called soft power. Right? They want to project soft power on world stage. Right? So uh, this is consistent what um, uh, with what China has been doing in other areas. Right? The Chinese government has been emphasizing. Right, we have the so-called four confidences, right? confidence in our ideology, confidence in our development path, confidence in our uh, institutions, so, and confidence in, uh, what is that? Um, so I, I even forget. So, but, so this is uh, you know, at least in part about building their soft power. Right? So that's why they cannot afford to be blatantly um, you know, biased in issuing the anti suit injunctions. So that may lead to what I call legal arbitrage. Right? So if um, you know, they um, are um, very easy to get, uh, if it is very easy to get anti suit injunctions from Chinese courts, right, that will attract uh, foreign um, patent owners to Chinese courts right, to seek anti suit injunctions and set pretty low uh, or, or uh, you know, um, you know, a set a friend race that in their favor. So, and this is already happening. If you look at the uh, Samsung versus Ericsson, right? Samsung sued Ericsson in Wuhan, um, you know, and sought anti-suit injunctions. Right? Uh, so, this may happen uh, to Chinese ICP owners like Huawei. Right? Uh, to some extent, Huawei is already becoming an APE uh, as you know the number of patents it owns. Right, gets higher and higher. Right, so um, so if China goes too far in this direction, right, so there there will be legal arbitrage, right, and that will be a natural limiting factor to how biased it could be. So I would say, and also there there might be another upside to Chinese anti suit injunctions, which is, um, you know, that may serve a catalyst for parties for the two sides to actually settle. Right, so to make an in, uh, imprecise. Uh, or imperfect analogy, we can think of anti suit injunctions as nuclear weapons. If both sides have acquired nuclear weapons, that's actually going to force them to come back to the negotiating table right, and, and have a solution. So I would argue that the ultimate goal of patentees is not really to win SEP litigation. The ultimate goal of patentees is to actually get a, the licensing agreements done. Right? Uh, so uh, it is not a coincidence, in my view, that shortly after the Chinese courts issued the anti suit injunctions, um, in a lot of cases, the two sides quickly settled. So it may actually lead to a, um, to, to a um, relatively quick solution of the disputes. Okay? So we saw the news release by Ericsson. Right? Once, Ericsson uh, once Ericsson sued Samsung over the SEPs, uh, there is a significant drop in Ericsson's revenue because of the delayed uh, negotiation. Right? So this might uh, actually serve uh, some useful function. Right? So that's my uh, second point here. So I think the, um, the Chinese anti suit injunctions may not, per se, they may not be a problem. Uh, I think the more important problem here is 
the lack of a uniform forum for addressing SCP disputes, and also the divergent evaluations attached by the different national courts uh, to the, um, to the uh, SCPs. So I think more uh, focus should be on, on those two issues. Uh, there have already been a lot of proposals uh, floating around. Right? Uh, some scholars proposed um, you know, maybe an international SEP tribunal. Right? Some scholars proposed uh, maybe there should be a, a forum selection clause in the standards, uh, in the SSO's uh, contracts. Uh, and uh, I think those are all, uh, all worthwhile exploring. And uh, I think another uh, potential um, effort you know, we should be uh, doing is to actually develop the so-called international common law on how to evaluate SEPs. Uh, so um, you know, we, should have, we should try to establish some widely accepted practices about how to value uh, SEPs, uh, to try to narrow the gap between uh, the valuations um, attached by, uh, for example, the UK course and the valuation attached by the Chinese course. Right? If we can make progress on that, then um, the anti-suit injunctions may not be that problematic anymore. So I will stop here, and I will look forward to discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Wontong. <clears throat> so um, let's go back to, uh, to Jorge and get the discussion going. Um, first, my first question is whether, w whether the competition you described is, is a zero-sum situation. There is an element uh, that is zero sum, which is when uh, we're thinking about investments made in appropriating the rents of the others. But there is, uh, there is a dimension that is not zero sum, which is that the investment in growing the standard uh, in one country generates a positive externality on the other. So the, 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 and that's the competition dimension that I was mentioning before. So the two sides have common interest in growing a standard, in making sure that the standard is, is, is growing because it's going to benefit uh, the, their economy is going to benefit their implementers, it's going to benefit their licensors. But then they are in opposite camps and they have conflicting interest and zero sum interest when they invest in, in grabbing the rents of the other side. So if, uh, let's say, E uh, is the place where most, in a, in a particular market seg segment, let's say consumer electronics, and E is the dominant implementer. Um, why is there a, uh, what is the incentive in E to uh, reach an accommodation? Why, why shouldn't they try to, uh, uh, you know, to capture the standard for that sector? Precisely. I think that at that point they will benefit from investing considerably in extracting rents from the other side. And if the other side has all the innovators, yeah. then they will make sure that they pay as little as possible and develop a legal uh, framework, both in terms of intellectual property and also an antitrust, that, uh, that grabs rents from the other side. Now, one important uh, asymmetry between E and Bellevue, uh, between West and East here, that one would need to consider is the extent to which you can design policies that are biased, uh, whether your legal system allows you to design those biased policies or not. Uh, and of course, it is easier in a context in which you know, the rule of law is weak. Because in that context, you can design an antitrust policy that hammers the foreigners but respects the domestic players. Mm -hmm. And you can design an intellectual property uh, legal system uh, that also acts asymmetrically. In, uh, in the West, we would think that that's difficult because you know, there is the rule of law. And um, there are appeals, in, in, and, and, and you would think that adjudication is independent of country of origin. Uh, there are exceptions to that, but I think that by and large is a true proposition. It, and, and that is the cost, therefore, of investing in capturing rents is very high in the West. It's much lower in countries where you, know, you don't have those protections and therefore policy can be biased um, at no cost, and no political cost, and not societal cost. OK, my last question. For, when I went talking at and Igor, if you have questions for Jorge, so much the better. Um, why is why, fragmentation might seem to be unsustainable in that the dominant uh, standard, let's say the one favoring implementers, um, will 
ultimately be the, the only survivor because the implementers, in the, let's say in the East, uh, part, yeah, in the, in the East, uh, have a significant share of the market. That it's not a question, there is a loss. There may be a loss of welfare, but it's not an, it's not an, un, a, 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 not an unstable equilibrium. Uh, that's a very good point. And I think that uh, if we look historically, when we have seen confrontations between standards, in many instances, one standard prevails and the others are dropped. And sometimes the one that uh, is dropped, or the ones that are dropped, are uh, actually those that are technologically superior. Uh, it, of course, in that model, everything was symmetric. In reality, there are fundamental asymmetries. And, uh, and I think that um, you know, if we have a world of fragmentation, you need to think about uh, who's going to be siding with which standard, what are the economies of scale and economies of uh, uh, network effects that each of the two standards will be able to generate. And you know, there is a chance, a likelihood, that you end up with one standard prevailing de facto. Yeah. Um, and that is you know, possibly the one that is where you have a balance between innovators and implementers that favors the implementers, because you know, presumably the economies of scale are greater at that level than at the innovation level. So in a world of fragmentation, it may be, in other words, to, to give you a headline that China prevails. Yeah. You go ahead. Did you have something from, for Jorge you wanted to ask? No, this was yeah. very good Went presentation. Um, I have nothing to add, but there's a question of them there. Oh, all right. I think <laughs> we're going to take a few minutes and then turn to okay. the questions from the audience. Um, mm -hmm. So we should now uh, focus on, uh, on you, Igor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, 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 was, I, I like your, 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 your message, I guess, because uh, uh, I, too, uh, have sort of um, said, uh, well, they said we now have convergence, and isn't that wonderful on all of those issues? But the convergence is a little bit asymmetrical in that um, Wired Planet, uh, uh, Higher and Sisville, ZTE, um, several of the other cases, in one in France, all come from the highest court in that jurisdiction. And Qualcomm does not, right? and Avanti does not. So we have two circuits that are in agreement, but um, it's not quite as much comfort as if we had the Supreme Court saying, saying that. Now, whether this will go to our Supreme Court, of course, is anyone's, anyone's guess, but there are other circuits yet to be heard from. And if there's a, a division, that may very well will happen. Are you confident that we can rely, or not confident, but are you betting we can rely on, uh, on the convergence? Well, I think there are strong arguments. Depend, it depends on the, on the question. So if you look at this question about where to license in the production chain, where we have convergence between Ninth Circuit and Fifth Circuit, I think there are strong arguments in both courts looked at the facts of the case, examined the uh, the licensing practices and came to the same conclusion as well as the European court. So maybe on some other issue there may be divergence, but at the moment I don't see any more any more disputes. And I saw just today that Avanci, a patent pool which licenses SAPs to car manufacturers, and there was a dispute between Continental and Avanci. So they have signed up now a significant number of new licenses and it's safe to say that majority now of the car market is licensed. So there is one evidence <coughs> that the market has accepted the licensing framework and they can move on maybe to another issue. In the automobile industry, the licenses are, pardon me, are they calculated on the final unit sales? Uh, as far as I know, uh -huh. yes. Like a smartphone. Uh, no, but they are, they are per unit sales, so they have policy of $15 per, per unit, right. it's not percentage. Right, well that was true with smartphones, but it was based on the value of the smartphone, some percentage of that, right? And you're saying it's value on, based on the value of the car? Uh, it's $15 per car. So okay. in smartphone right. so there, was, uh, there was, was a derived. percentage. Yeah, we don't percentage. know how that was derived, mm -hmm. okay. But lastly, you thought it was a good idea that the Department of Justice has withdrawn the proposed policy statement. I agree with that, because it was a nightmare. Alex over there uh, helped the Global Antitrust Institute navigate the problems there and file comments. 
um, and uh, uh, absent contradiction, I'll assume that they took it away because of our comments that they withdrew it, but in any <laughs> event. Uh, but to say it was, they, that's not all they did. They also withdrew the 2019 policy statement. And then enigmatically say, well, it's, it, it'll be better for everybody if we just go case by case. Well, how could it be better to go case by case when there's no policy statement than it would be if there were a policy statement that also had to be applied case by case? I, I don't understand how you can think that's a good idea. Well, in Europe, we don't have policy statements, and it's functioning very well with courts looking at the case, deciding, and making the case law as the cases appear. So, but, well, and as you say, our case law is favorable too, and sensible, and so on, on the subjects. But um, it's expensive, and a lot of things are not going to get adjudicated for that reason. Uh, I mean, to have no guidance, businesses don't know how to plan. They can, you know, they can take the risk of being sued, um, but that's not an ideal situation. Well, I'm not a U.S. lawyer, but looking from a, a European perspective, even if you have a policy statement, still that's not a binding law. You would have to go to courts. And uh, I didn't see, even if the DOJ would say they were going to prosecute whatever they want, whatever there is policies, they would have to go to courts and then prove their theory of harm and whether there is antitrust injury and no, so on. No, I understand that. So, it's just that people's conduct it can, you know, can be directed by a policy statement to what the government or the agency thinks is, is a good policy, uh, or they can be totally in the dark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I take your point. Maybe, maybe you're saying the convergence is that with Europe is that neither of us now has policy statements. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we converge, converge well, on that. If I may chip in that, Please. I mean, in, in, in Europe, we have the 2017 communication from the European Commission, which provides some, albeit limited, uh, guidance. And uh, there are comments now, discussions, that uh, the Commission may produce a, a new communication further clarifying some, some of the issues, like, for example, the level of licensing, et cetera. And then we had an expert group that produced a document, which, you know, it's, uh, it's not necessarily that clarifying, but I think that there have been attempts to try to provide some guidance to the contracting parties as to what is legal and what is not legal, what is correct and what is not correct. And of course, ZTE is written like legislation, yeah, right? It really yeah. looks like a code, <laughs> very peculiar. Uh, Wentag, uh, I, I didn't understand uh, uh, how the situation, could, and maybe I mistook some aspect of it, could encourage settlements where one side has the, uh, the ability to, to uh, prevail in court. I mean, why, it seems to me it's ambiguity that encourages settlements. Oh, um, I'm just making this observation. You know, shortly after the Chinese courts issued the anti suing injunctions, the two sides oh, settled. Oh, after it's issued. Okay. Yeah, after, that, yes. Yeah, that clarifies it. Yeah, because, um, you know, now each side has a um, bargaining chip, right? Um, so th they, they realized they couldn't be beat the other side in, right. in their own court only. Okay. Right? So th that will force them to come back to the negotiation table. So I'm a denied an injunction. Mm -hmm. Now we go back and negotiate, right? Y yes. Except that uh, um, at the end of the day, the only thing you're going to owe me is the Frand royalty. Yes. So you have an incentive to make the end of the day as far from now as possible, uh -huh. right? to put it off. Yes. Do you have to post a bond? Uh, I think that's the, that's the case. Uh, you have to post a bond to, do. to request okay. the anti suing injunctions. Yeah. Yes. Well, that, that makes all the difference. I think that was the brilliant thing in ZTE, actually, was the mm -hmm. best part. Yeah. So the, for, to uh, questions, just tell us who you are, please. Oh, my name is Rick Neifeld. I'm just a piddling patent attorney from around the corner. <laughs> and closer to the mic. Uh, but I do have some questions about the theory uh, that Dr. Batilli you put forward. I realize that was a simplified model, but you know, I'm thinking in my head, well, how does that actually work out in the real world when we're dealing with rights and development of markets? And um, okay, so I've got East versus West, two countries, and they're increasing the details of their standard, as I understand it, and that affects the benefits to everybody. But what I see hap have seen happening over a long period of time 
anecdotally, is that there's a concentration of technologies in various countries in specific areas, first to market, first to develop. The U.S. is heavy in biotech, for example. Taiwan now is the I mean, cornerstone manufacturer for high-end semiconductor equipment and so forth and so on. Different poles of the world have different, not locks, but strategic advantages on different technologies. And presumably it's because they've, you know, they were ahead in the R&D in that field. They have a patent lead preventing other people from competing. And therefore, the number of people doing research in one particular field in a country that doesn't have a lot of people working in that field, a small market is small, and they stay behind. And the people in advanced in, that, in the country that does a lot of that research has a great number of scientists working in it, like biotech in the US, stays in the lead. Um, so if you get in first, you win. If you get in second, you don't win. Maybe you don't lose because you benefit from the, all the development technology, but you're not the big maker in that space. You're the second, you know, the second or third world order. Um, that seems to me, and I don't know if this is true, does that, it, do those factories play into a more sophisticated version of your model? Are they relevant to your model since your model, as I understand it, dealt with the standard, not with the intellectual property rights and technological base related to the production of the products under that standard in the particular countries involved East and West? And Sounds given like that it's not an east and west world, it's a five polar world, maybe, depending upon the market. Can you shed any light on those issues generally? That's a, that's a very good comment. I think that every model has to try to capture some reality and simplify that reality. I think that uh, you're right that uh, the model that I laid out doesn't apply universally, and there will be some industries where it doesn't fit the facts, uh, even in a stylized way. The, the, the situation that I had in mind when, when drafting that model is the 5G situation or the 4G, 5G situation. We're talking about wireless standards in which both East and West participate both in terms of you know, having featuring uh, implementers and having uh, also uh, in, in innovators and sometimes being vertically integrated. That's the kind of world that the model feeds. It doesn't quite work with chipsets um, it doesn't quite work with other areas of high tech. Well, thank you for clarifying. Hi, um, Claudia Tapia from Ericsson. First of all, thank you so much for these excellent presentations. I enjoy them very much. Um, I was wondering when I was listening to you and you were talking about um, in Europe possible guidelines. Uh, we already have uh, from the Court of Justice of the EU, which is above the European Commission and above the European courts, uh, a ruling where they establish a whole framework uh, where SCP's licensing should go in order to be um, an injunction not anti-competitive. So I wonder whether this is really needed more, more guidelines. Uh, for example, the topic of, of who takes a license, um, the, the court already established look at commercial practices. Uh, and I guess this is the reason why courts, national courts have not granted um, this foreign defense um, when, the, when the patent holders follow commercial practice. Um, and, but my question I had, it's a little bit different, it's more related to China. I've seen several um, guidelines on SCP, SCP licensing for automotive, um, also in general SCP licensing, how high do you think are the chances that that Chinese courts will follow those principles? And this goes to whoever wants to take it. Thank you. Uh, so uh, maybe I can chime in. So are you referring to the recent SEP uh, licensing guidelines issued by the Chinese Automobile uh, Association? Um, I, I think those uh, guidelines are not developed in, in vacuum. So uh, they are developed with inputs from courts, from you know legal professionals. So there's a high chance, I, I think, uh, you know, if those issues do come up in courts, you know, the Chinese courts m might at least take into account those guidelines. Uh, so they may actually follow what is being written there. Um, that's my view based on you know what happened in the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And if, yeah. I'm, if I may add about the regulation, it is true that in Europe uh, we don't have now yet policy statements as they were in the US, but currently European Commission is consulting on SAP framework and maybe next year they will come up with regulation. So maybe they will regulate, mm. not by guidelines, but really by hard law. And we can debate whether that is good or bad, is that optimal strategy, but this is something that may come up in Europe. Mm -hmm. We have um, six minutes, two questions, and two answers, so be brief. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so my name is Jake Nelson. I had a quick question for, your, uh, for you with your model. I was wondering, are there any type types of things that you could consider as externalities that would be uh, either costs or benefits that could be applied to both sides, um, such that you would be adding a term that is not just inverse for each party, if that makes sense. For instance, a cost to you know, take on some uh, system might be beneficial to both sides, but there might be another cost, and yeah. So in the model, there are externalities already embedded because the model, uh, if you remember the benefits, uh, of, uh, the benefit uh, from the standards are the result of the efforts made by the two sides. So when I invest in one of the countries, I'm generating a positive externality on, on, on the other side. So there are already some externalities. The, the problem is that you have then this other dimension, which we typically ignore, which is purely you know, the Begadai neighbor strategy or the, or, the, or the rent shifting strategy. And that's where the externalities are negative uh, and compensate. But, but it is because there are externalities in the model that fragmentation is not the solution. Because if you go for fragmentation, uh, you can go for fragmentation because you think that, okay, it's the only solution possible. And look, I mean, there may be defense considerations, security considerations that push you in that direction, but leaving that aside. Uh, but but it, you may think that this is the solution because otherwise I'm being expropriated. But all that I'm saying is that because of the externalities are so important, that's likely to be uh, very negative. Alternatively, you may go for fragmentation as a way to uh, enforce good behavior on the other side, saying if you don't behave well, I, I, I go on my own. That's a bad idea because you know, these standards are not reversible. So if the other guy starts cooperating, then what do you do? So you, you need a punishment strategy that is reversible to, to discipline the other side. But the externalities are key. If, if there were an externalities, let's go for a fragmented world, and that's it. Yeah, I just didn't know if anything ever could be non-zero sum, if that makes sense. So it would be positive for both sides or negative for both sides, as opposed to just being you know, completely adversarial, if that makes sense. And, and you know, again, the investments, the G investments, the, sure. those are non-adversarial. Those right. are beneficial for both of them. And that's why we have a prisoner's dilemma. That, makes sense. that you know, if we were able to coordinate with the other side, now, what is the problem? The problem is that if the other guys decide, for example, to develop, uh, to uh, have anti-suit injunctions or develop yeah. their law in a way that it becomes appropriative, what do we do? Uh, do we respond with anti-suit injunctions? Yeah, they, we go to the table, but the problem is that um, time, the cost of delay, is different for innovators than for implementers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, time passed is a loss for the innovator. Time pass is money saved for the implementer. And so uh, I think that the strategy brings people to the table, but it brings people to the table with rents shifting from one side to the other. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Barnett, USC Law School. Uh, the impression that I got uh, from two of the panelists seems to give the impression that the world is converging on a re legal regime that is at least somewhat more amenable to the ability of uh, SEP owners to enforce and license their rights. I'd like to give you three legal data points that suggest that that is not the case. Uh, starting with the US, although it's true that the SEP policy statement was withdrawn, I don't think there can be any doubt whatsoever that the leadership at both of the antitrust agencies is firmly committed to the view that SEPs are a tax on the industry and that they should take every legal effort possible to limit the enforcement and the licensing of the rights. And additionally, we do not yet have a US court that has ever issued an injunction to an SEP owner, although the Federal Circuit precedent allows for the possibility. If we move over to Europe, while it's true there that the climate in the judiciary is amenable to injunctions and they have been issued, 
it, we continue to see in the reports issued by the EU Commission uh, an, imp an implementer bias. There is a view that p patent holdup is endemic. They make unsubstantiated assertions uh, that there are licensing thickets and, and SEPs are obstacles to innovation in automotive and a variety of IoT markets that don't even yet exist. If we move over to China, over there, while it's true that the anti-suit injunctions have ceased for about a year and a half, if we look over what's happening at the SAMR, the antitrust agencies, they have issued guidelines that are indi indicating, although they are draft guidelines, that if you have a dominant position, and if you are an SCP owner, you have a dominant position, it appears that you will have a requirement to, you will have a duty to deal. You have a requirement to license all parties. In addition, in the Hitachi case, we have for the first time the application of the essential facility doctrine to a patent which is owned by a dominant firm. So when I look around the world, I see a world that continues to be mostly implementer friendly and has not yet internalized much of the economic learning, which shows, as Dr. Padilla pointed out, that all of these decisions are not compatible with a rational innovation policy because they shift rents away from the companies that are responsible for the innovation without which the entire ecosystem would not exist. Thank you. Comments on that? I, I can go first. Thank you, Jonathan, and I agree with you. Uh, as for the US, I would like to see s someone try to test the eBay case now and see whether there is still a possibility to obtain injunction against unwilling licensee in the US. We don't see it. We think it's probably biased to get for the implementers, but theoretically it's possible, and I hope there will be a case. As for Europe, you are right that many policy reports are biased on the side of implementers, and I, I'm personally afraid of what the EU regulation may be now, currently, as we have it by the court system. I think it's well balanced. It take in, takes into account both parties, but we'll see what the European Commission will do and whether it will shift the balance more to the implementer side. One comment about Europe, if, if I may. I think that it's difficult to talk about the European Commission. I think that you need to l look inside the European Commission. I think that one thing is DigiComp, and another thing is other parts of the Commission. DigiComp is very much aligned with your agencies and takes the view that holdup is a real problem and wants to intervene. There are other parts of the Commission that don't agree with that whatsoever, and that they realize that holdout is potentially the real problem, and I think that they're reining in uh, Digicom. What happens at the end, you know, it's all the conflicts within the Commission and then 27 countries. So you can imagine that it's hard to predict. <laughs> so maybe I can say something about the Chinese side. Um, so I'm not surprised at all that the Chinese agencies are taking this pro-implementer approach and of course as well. Uh, you know, I think that's largely because of um, China's position in this, um, you know, patent value chain. Right? Most of the um, uh, companies there are still implementers, even though we, we are beginning to have Huawei, um, you know, to be to become, um, you know, innovators in some sense. So I'm not surprised. But as China moves up the value chain, um, you know, I think that might begin to change. Um, so I think this this is very consistent with what we have seen um, in international trade. I, I write in international trade as well. Uh, if you have a, a you know. Um, if you have a divide between the so-called uh, producing interest and consuming interest, uh, if most of your uh, country is uh, consuming interest, then you will be pro-free trade. Right? Um, but if most of your country is producing interest, you will be against free trade. So I think that's largely, um, uh, I think it's largely because of that factor. Um, but my point I'm trying to make here is, uh, if China uh, wants to be too biased in in uh, you know, favoring uh, the implementers. Uh, at some point, when China becomes um, an innovator's country, that might actually backfire, right? Because, um, you know, um, the implementers from foreign countries are going to come to China to seek favorable <laughs> friendlies <laughs> against their own uh, innovators. So, But that, that presumes that they're going to be Thank I'm you, uh, uh, Yes, yeah. so uh, presuming that you know, they, uh, they cannot be too blatantly biased, right? Because my, part of my position is you know, they want to build this soft power. Uh, they cannot afford to be too blatantly biased.
That's a big if. Uh, if, there's yes, anyone, um, thank you. if there's anyone who is still uh, concerned about um, hold up being a major problem, a significant problem, I commend to you, if you haven't read it, Greg Sidak's article, is, is patent hold up a hoax? Uh, a, a really delicious article, uh, even if you don't, aren't fully convinced. Uh, please join me in, in uh, thanking our panel. They've done a great job. <laughs>